Hi, this is JR from jrfibonacci.wordpress.com and this is many words but only one reality. There is only reality. Can you name anything that exists that is not part of reality? Can you name any part of reality that does not exist? Language is just an aspect of reality. Myths and lies and fiction and jokes and pretense and denial are all actual patterns of reality. Reality includes the actual patterns of myths in language, lies in language, fiction in language, jokes in language, pretense in language, and denial in language, like there's no such thing as denial. That's the process of denying. So words are real words. Dreams are real dreams, like when you're asleep at night and you have the experience of dreaming. Well, those are real dreams. Hallucinations are real hallucinations. Words on reality and realities are real words. But there's no such thing as unreality, and there's not more than one reality. There's only one reality. There's only reality. There is no reality except for reality. This, this stuff sounds silly, but in a minute you'll, you'll I'm going to repeat these patterns in a, in a phrase that and some phrases that may be more familiar to you that are going to make more sense for you that may have been confusing for you before. We'll get to confusion in a minute. Uh, there are, There is no reality except for reality. There are not two or more isolated realities like, um, you know, the reality of Europe and the reality of America. They're not isolated. The reality of America is is... Like there's land and there's language and there's the English language and the culture. We can talk about distinctions between America and Europe. But they're not two separated realities. There are two separated categories of reality. There is only one reality. There are not two or more isolated realities. Um, so... Uh, there's only one reality which is eternal and continuous in space and time and so on. Boundless, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Nothing happens except through the power of reality. There is no other power except reality. Reality is almighty. We could say reality is the almighty. There is not one reality in conflict with another reality, a separate reality, an isolated reality. There's, there's only one reality. There's no conflict between realities. There can be conflict within reality. Conflict can be a pattern of reality, but there's no conflict between realities. Now, while all of this is relatively simple logically, lots of people can get very confused about the sheer simplicity of reality. Of course, confusion is also a, a real pattern in reality. When you confuse one thing for another, like if I confuse um, the word C in Spanish, meaning yes, for the word C in English, meaning a big body of water, or the word C in English meaning um, the act of vision or the process of vision or the letter C, well they all sound the same. So we could, you know, confuse one with the other because they're similar in sound. In fact, they're the same in sound. So words could be confusing. A lot of jokes and puns. Uh, focus on the on the fact that the word that a certain word could have two a, a certain sound could be two different words like the word right 
could be spelled R-I-T-E or R-I-G-H-T or, um, or W-R-I-T-E. C could be, in Spanish, it could be S-E-A, it could be S-E-E. These are the kind of puns that comedians and uh, all the rest of us uh, will sometimes make for fun. Is it confusing? Yeah, but it's it's for fun. So confusion is a real pattern in reality. Fun is a real category in reality. Now, how about this? Spirituality and religion are about resolving basic confusions about language. That's my assertion. However, many people may not be familiar with that idea and may confuse spirituality and religion for something that they're not. Or perhaps spirituality and religion are about creating confusions about language. Perhaps they're, they're jokes. But there are some major exceptions to that premise where confusions about language are clarified through spirituality and religion to the extent that uh, this talk might clarify some confusions about language. It might be a spiritual or religious talk. We could say philosophical. We could say educational. Um, but as we as we go through this, you'll hear a lot of directly spiritual and religious comments. And there's not a whole lot longer, but let's let's get right into that. Let's review one of the most common spiritual words. God, in the English language, one of the most common spiritual words. I assert that God is actually just another word for reality. Even if people may confuse the word God to refer to something else. People can really confuse. There's a, a reality of confusion, and people can confuse the word God for something else. But the word God just means reality. That is what I'm asserting. In considering this idea, let's review three simple statements about reality. There is no reality except for reality. There are not two or more isolated realities. There's only one reality, which is eternal and continuous and boundless and omnipresent and omnipotent. Now let's replace the word reality with the word God. Most people wouldn't have any concern with what I just said about reality. They go, of course, yeah. Now I put the word God in there. Let's see if uh, any of this sounds familiar to you. Maybe you'll argue with it or something, which is really kind of an interesting thing. Anyway, let's see if, uh, if we take the word reality and replace it with God, if this sounds familiar. There is no God except for God. There are not two or more isolated gods. There is only one God, which is eternal and continuous and boundless and omnipresent and omnipotent. That's all the stuff I just said about reality. That's the core teachings of many religious traditions about God. Isn't that interesting? God can be represented in multiple aspects, such as the three metaphorical archetypes of the Holy Trinity. But that is still monotheism, not poly polytheism. It's just different aspects of God. And that would include the Holy Trinity of Vishnu, Indra, and Brahman, the Hindu Trinity. Many Christians would, many people who don't understand Hinduism very well, probably don't speak Hindi or Sanskrit or any, you know, aren't familiar with those languages. Um, they, uh, they might say, well, those are polytheists. Um, they might say that. But polytheism and monotheism are not even important issues necessarily. The important issue is that there is a singularity that unifies any set of three archetypes. It's not, you know, a, a contradiction of monotheism to say the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Those three archetypes are not about isolated, conflicting um, personalities. There are three aspects of reality. They refer to three aspects of reality, um, similar to the Holy Trinity of Vishnu Indra and um, I wrote Vish Vishnu Indra and Brahman. I need to change that. It's Vishnu, Vishnu Shiva and Brahman. 
Anyway, those re refer to the creator, the sustainer, and the destroyer. Those would be words we could translate, you know, if we translated the Sanskrit into English, we would say the creator, the sustainer, and the uh, destroyer. But God is the, in, in Christianity, we would say God's the creator, sustainer, and destroyer. God creates, sustains, and destroys. That's all of Vishnu, Indra, and Shiva mean. I think I got the order wrong there. But, uh, yep, sorry, Vishnu, <laughs> uh, Shiva, Brahman. Anyway, uh, maybe, whatever. I don't know Hinduism very well. Any Hindus out there will probably recognize that. But the point is, the the trinity of different aspects or facets of God is kind of like when you divide the year into four seasons. That's not denying that there's an annual cycle of, of you know, 365 days. There's just four cycles or four subcategories that we can divide it into, but there's, you know, there's no conflict between four seasons and one year. There's no conflict between 24 hours and one day. The idea that there's a conflict between polytheism and monotheism is from a complete misunderstanding of, of religion and language. So, anyway, if... Uh, if the thing I was saying about, you know, there's no God except for God, and there's no reality except for reality, if, those, if you don't recognize those as religious um, phrasings, well, you may not be familiar with them with the major monotheistic, monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, because there is no God but God. There is no reality but reality. That's a very common saying in uh, Islam. Uh, there's only one God, which is eternal, continuous, boundless, omnipresent, almighty, omnipotent. There's only one reality. There's only one God, which is eternal, omnipotent, continuous, omnipresent, holy, whole, complete, perfect, pure. All that, that's a common saying within um, Judaism and Christianity. Um, obviously, they use different languages, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Spanish, English, Arabic, whatever. But... The idea is uh, the same, and of course, different people. Like I've mentioned in the previous blog, which you can click back to. Uh, let's uh, many names, but oh God! Um, in the previous blog, I refer to um, <clears throat> I forgot what I was saying. Uh oh. What do I refer to in the previous blog? There's no God but God. That's the way Islam puts it. Anyway, um, the, the previous blog is, is similar to this one. I forget what I was going to say. Um, but we can, we can extend the basic idea that there's only one reality and it's unified and take that over to, to Eastern um, Eastern religious terminology. I want to repeat the thing about you know polytheism and monotheism and you know different languages in Judaism or Christianity and so on. It's kind of like metric and uh, what is the other I don't know standard international way of measuring feet and yards and stuff miles. They're just two systems of, of categorizing, um, of, of quantifying, of categorizing or quantifying or labeling. It doesn't change the distance of something to measure it in centimeters or in inches. It doesn't matter if we talk in polytheistic terms or monotheistic terms. There's only one reality. Oh, so many people who are, who are studying religion don't know this. And this is what I had forgot, was, was referring to about the previous blog. In the previous blog, I refer to a parrot or an infant who just practices words. Well, most people who are practitioners of religions, they don't understand that there's only one reality and that God is that reality and that that reality is God and that's what the word God or Allah refers to or Yahweh, etc. They don't understand the term God. They're just practicing the repetitions of, of some ancient phrase, not understanding them, like a parrot or an infant. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not understanding. 
they 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 may be ignorant, they may be confused, uh, or they may understand. But by your fruits, you will know them. You know the ones who understand, it will be evident. The ones who don't, well, they'll get no arguments and they'll get you know get all offended about you know oh is English the best language or Arabic or you know some kind of kind of weird stuff like that. Um, they won't see the the connection and unity of of all religions. They'll think oh you know Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are are, are related, but they're completely different from Buddhism. Well, that's just based on a misunderstanding of Buddhism. And and again, because many Buddhists might not understand Buddhism very well, they're still studying it. They're still learning it. They've been learning it for 2,600 years. They haven't got it yet. <laughs> or maybe they have, but um, whatever. Like, this stuff is is valuable for people to study, but just because study, somebody is studying the Arabic language or studying calculus doesn't mean they're a master at it yet. They're just a student. So if a three-year-old repeats a phrase like there is no God but God and doesn't really have any understanding of it, we don't have any. We don't need to have any contempt for that. If people are, are in distress and confused about heaven and God, we could have, have compassion for them rather than, you know, uh, I don't know, condemn them just notice that they don't understand the vast majority of practitioners of religion are still practicing they haven't got it yet so back to uh, some some Easter terminology here there are not two or more isolated Buddha natures there is one Buddha nature and it is eternal and continuous and boundless and omnipresent and omnipotent that is, generally speaking, the Hindu teaching of Advaita. Not just the Buddhist teaching, but the Hindu teaching of Advaita, as well as the primary meaning of the word yoga, which means union. There's only one Buddha nature. There's only one reality. There are not two or more isolated realities. Now, here's a similar variation um, going a little further east than India to China. The Tao that can be spoken of is just a labeling of the Tao, not the actual fullness of the Tao. There is no Tao except for the Tao. Words about the Tao are not the actual Tao. They're just words about the Tao. The Tao that can be spoken of is just a labeling or description of the Tao, not the actual fullness of the Tao. So there's the 10,000 things referred to in that first uh, first chapter, I think is what it's called, the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. The Tao is the source of the arising of the 10,000 things, or the multitude of things. Um, it's the same, it's the basic monotheistic idea. There's only one reality. It has many labels and many forms and many facets. We could divide it into three and call it a trinity. We could divide it into 24 and we can divide it into 365. It doesn't matter if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. There's only one reality. We can label it in lots of different ways. English, Arabic, Spanish, Latin, Hebrew, whatever. There's only one reality. <clears throat> so let's, let's move on to this. There's a picture there in the blog of uh, the uh, ancient... Hebrew um, conception of the universe. I don't know who made that, how old that is. Obviously, it's English words, not ancient Hebrew, so it's not like that is a you know 4,000-year-old document or something. But that's a depiction of, of someone's understanding of the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe, including the heaven and the earth and so on. So uh, let's, as we before replaced the word reality with God, let's now do the same thing, or with Tao or Buddha nature. Their nature. Let's now do the same thing with another familiar spiritual word, heaven. There's only one heaven, which is eternal and continuous and boundless and omnipresent and omnipotent. There are not two or more isolated heavens. There is no heaven except for heaven. We know that ancient people use the term heaven in two distinct ways, though. 
to reference the sky and outer space where clouds and the sun and moon and planets and stars can be seen. That's the heavens or heaven. And then they also use the word heaven to reference some place or an experience of total acceptance and bliss. Uh, the ending of, of the experience of isolation and suffering and, and, and distress and torment and so on. That's another use of the word heaven. So the sky is boundless and eternal. It's always been there and there's no real you know, boundary in the sky. We can, again, divide it into the 12 zodiac regions, but dividing into 4 or into 12 or into 30, that's um, just the mansions of heaven, the mansions of God or the houses of God. There's 12 houses in astrology. You're just saying, hey, you know, we're just slapping over this division into 12, just like we can have 12 months and four seasons and one year. They're not um, exclusive. They're different frameworks for um, being more and more precise about you know uh, uh, something that can be divided into 365 parts or into four parts. Um, so the sky is boundless, and it in and of itself is boundless. Again, we can measure different portions of it, but it's inherently boundless, and it's eternal. It's always been there. It will always be there. It's there now, and that's you know what we can say about the sky. It's timeless. It's eternal. Um, the basic idea of astrology is that heavenly activity, such as sunlight or the phase of the moon, influences earthly phenomenon in a predictable way such as the varying warmth of the cycles of day and night, cycles, or the cycles of the seasons, as well as the cycle of tides and menstruation. Um, so that's the basic idea of astrology. Many people would say, oh, that's not astrological, because astrology is not true. Well, that's, a, again, a basic misunderstanding of the ancient use of the term astrology. If one looks back at, you know, what what are the original texts many, many thousands of years ago? What are those people writing about? What did Isaac Newton and Galileo and all the people that we think of as these great scientists and, and astronomers, what did they say about astrology? Well, they said some pretty reasonable and scientific stuff. So how, how that word astrology is used, it's an English word, right? So if we look back at Vedic astrology from 3,000 or 5,000 years ago or something, well, they didn't use the term astrology because that's an English word. But if we look at the science and the actual you know, observations they were making, they're just talking about uh, things like, you know, 19 year eclipse cycles and how that influences the activity of the sun and how that influences phenomenon on the earth. That's the same kind of stuff that NASA scientists and astrophysicists study. These people were studying it many thousands of years ago with much less precise, you know, physical technology like telescopes and stuff, but um, their observations were entirely. Um, consistent with modern observations. All right, now let's consider another two phrases common to Christianity. Well, let me, let me back up and comment on why astrology, this is not in the blog, but why astrology would be um, targeted as something to be warned about or something that's forbidden. Um, that may be a reference to using astrology to forecast for personal you know um, decisions and stuff instead of adhering to um, some religious teaching or um, one's own inner calling like to go to somebody else and believe that a, a professional astrologer knows you better than you do the church of Rome at some point said you know, the people who are out there practicing that art, some of them, are, you know, offering that service, some of them are not that reliable. We want to discourage you from using their services. 
it doesn't mean that there's no valid astrology or you know the the sun isn't the center around which the earth rotates that's that's not the issue there the um, warning about astrology was in regard I believe was in regard to um, uh, misleading forecasts I don't think they were saying people shouldn't study um, astronomy now of course given uh, the, the Vatican's response to Galileo's research maybe they were saying people should not study <laughs> astronomy maybe it was a, a, a threat to their power who knows but I'm trying to give them kind of a little gentleness and, and you know looking at why they would be so concerned about astrology well there are some bad practitioners who might have used the term astrology as it's you know as the Latin phrase or the English word refers to so keep in mind that when we see a reference to the word astrology in English it could refer to lots of different things um, a lot of different foreign words could all be translated into astrology by some translator. They might take six or twenty different words and translate them all as astrology. Okay, so let's consider another two phrases common to Christianity, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The English word kingdom is also easily replaced with realm or reality. The realm of reality is like a mustard seed or a vine. A small seed produces a huge tree with many branches and limbs there's no part of reality that isn't in the realm of reality there's no part of the realm of reality that's outside of reality there's nothing outside of reality reality is inclusive so we're talking about instead of a dualistic or divisive or divided um, worldview or, or language or perspective we're talking about the perspective or the realm of reality itself this isn't too uh, cancel or replace anything else. This is just a different model. This is to fulfill or complete or this or to perfect our understanding of language. So the the tree of dualism and the knowledge of good and evil, or what to avoid and what to um, you know uh, focus on as a priority and so on. The good stuff and then the things to avoid. The bad stuff. Well, that's all fine. This is not that. This is a conversation about the unity of reality. Uh, there's no part of the realm of reality that's outside of reality. Reality is inclusive, like every branch of a vine includes the vine, and the vine includes every branch. Reality abides in each of us, and we each abide in reality. We cannot be separated from reality. So it's meaningless to speak of reconnecting to reality or reconnecting to God. The realm of reality is within you. The realm of God is within you. The realm of heaven is within you. The realm of reality will not approach you from the outside. You cannot enter into it like a man walking through You can't enter into the realm of reality like a man walking through a doorway. I am reality, and so are you. Before Abraham was, reality exists. Jesus, uh, this is a... Uh, more of a specific uh, passage of the New Testament here. Next, uh, Jesus was asked, which teaching is the greatest? And he quoted the Old Testament saying, Hear ye, O Israel, reality is continuous, whole, holy, unending, perfect, pure, complete. Study reality with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your life. The one who had questioned Jesus then said, Rabbi, you speak the truth. There is only one reality, and there is nothing outside of reality. Now, if you were to go and look at the Bible passage I'm referring to, they don't use the word reality. The English translators don't use the word reality. But consider that what that um, ancient Hebrew scribe and uh, Jesus were, were referring to in that, in that dialogue is reality. It's the linguistic distinction reality, poorly translated. And the word God... No, we don't need to keep it. We don't need to exclude it. It's fine. Um, it might be more precise or more useful to say reality. 
for those familiar with the New Testament, they can find the common mistranslations of the, the previous simple ideas of Jesus that I just, just paraphrased there. Um, note that any translator who did not understand the simplicity of the teaching would not be able to use modern English, uh, would not be able to use a modern English word like reality you know, to, to do the translation. They wouldn't understand that well. And they'd likely use a much broader translation. Um, I mentioned before somebody translating, you know, 20 different words all as astrology. Well, in here's a case that's that I'm absolutely sure is how it was done. This is like, you know, instead of translating re, some ancient word as in the English word reality, they would translate some ancient word as God. Well, this is similar to when uh, English people are translating the Greek words agape, eros, and philos all into the same English word love. So in in, in English we, we can use a phrase to distinguish agape, eros, and philos, but we don't have a single word necessary necessarily. Um, you know, philos is normally like brotherly love. Well there's no one word for brotherly love. So these English translators translated all three of the Greek words all into the same English word. And for people who are like kind of, you know, translation um, enthusiasts or Bible enthusiasts, they're aware there's a lot of Hebrew words and a lot of Greek words that are translated differently by different translators and some significant inconsistency amongst the various translations done in the last several hundred into the English language. Um, if you want to know uh, uh, how to translate ancient Hebrew into English, you could ask lots of people who speak English and they would all translate a little differently based on their understanding of the Hebrew, as well as based on their fluency of English, as well as based on who they're talking to. They would all those factors would all be involved in do they translate something into the word God or into the word love or into the word reality? Well, it depends. It depends on how well they know Hebrew, how well they understand the material, how well they know English, and, and also depends on who they're talking to. So again, when, we're, when we take somebody who doesn't know uh, reality very well, and they become a teacher of religion and spirituality, and they're teaching three-year-olds and eight-year-olds and 20-year-olds and 50-year-olds, well, there's going to be some confusion that arises. This is, uh, we could call it unfortunate, but it's just a part of reality. If you, if you try and learn Spanish from somebody who doesn't know Spanish very well, they've only read it, they've never pronounced it, they don't know, really know how to pronounce anything, well, that can produce some confusion if you actually ever talk to somebody who really speaks Spanish. <laughs> All right. So imagine someone trying to translate the words calculus, trigonometry, and algebra when they do not really understand anything but arithmetic. Well, in that case, they would call all forms of math by the single label math. That would be completely predictable, understandable. We don't have any you know, contempt for somebody who doesn't understand higher math very well just calling it all math. They don't understand calculus. They don't understand algebra. They just know, oh, that's the type of math, so we're just going to call it all math. And they don't know the difference between, you know, somebody who, who doesn't know the difference between calculus and algebra could recognize either of the two as types of math, but they wouldn't know which is which. So they just call it all math. They just call it all love. They just call it all astrology or God or reality or whatever they do. Translators have an interesting task, and uh, they do as well as they do. Some do better than others. So in any language, there are many names for different aspects of reality. Brahman is a word for reality. Allah is in a different word, a different language, a word for reality. Yahweh is a word for reality. God is a word for reality. These are not referencing different ideas. These four words in these four languages are referencing very similar ideas, or even the exact same idea. So they all reference the boundless reality, which includes all the forms referenced by language. All the identities referenced by language. Those are all just branches of the singular complete 
boundless reality. The inclusive reality. All of the branches of reality are reality already. Heaven or Nirvana could be a reference to the direct experience or realization that reality is an infinite, continuous, living process. Language, which is a function of reality, only labels different qualities of reality. It doesn't actually isolate reality into six different realities or 365 different realities. Language just helps us to distinguish different aspects of reality. It doesn't divide reality in a fundamental way like breaking it apart into separate realities. There aren't separate realities. There's only one reality. So language does not divide or isolate the continuous unity of reality into multiple disconnected realities. You can't have, you know, spring without it right into fall. They're not disconnected realities. You can't have spring at the same time as having uh, without it being, you know, some, let's say it's it's June, not, what does it say? June 29th, 2012. Those aren't three separate things. It's 2012. It's June. It's the 29th. It's uh, uh, a Friday. Those aren't contradictions. Those are different labels of the same thing. Those are different distinctions of the same thing. It's kind of like saying height and weight. If you take a, a body and say, okay, it's six feet tall and it's 200 pounds. 200 pounds and 6 feet are not exclusions. They're not isolated realities. They're different ways of labeling or um, evaluating, evaluating or measuring one body. Reality can be labeled in its various aspects. Different elements or qualities of reality can be distinguished. But there's no separate reality disconnected from some other reality. There's only one reality. Identifications in language are just real identifications in language. In the beginning, reality spoke language into existence. Language was with reality, within reality, and of reality. Language was not separate from reality. Compare, compare the simplicity of what I just said, that statement, with the common mislations of John 1.1 1, 1, about Logos, the Word, God, all that stuff. I'm going to repeat it in a clear way of saying it. In the beginning, reality spoke language into existence. Language was with reality, within reality, and of reality. Language was reality. Language was not separate from reality. That is what John 1.1 1, 1 is referencing. These confused you know, Christian denominations that don't get it, well, they're working with bad translations. And they're doing the best they can. They're confused. And their fruits are evidence of you know, the extent of their understanding and comprehension and realization. So it is through a fundamental confusion about language that naive people can innocently but foolishly or vainly, futilely, believe in a schizophrenic or broken reality, like over here is God and over here is the devil and there's a conflict between them. That is not um, the worldview presented by Jesus, for instance. The idea of, of a devil is about, um, well, it's a story, of course, when we hear about Jesus going to the desert for 40 days and tempted by the devil. Well, he's experiencing temptation. There's a real thing that's temptation, and it can seem like it's this you know, external spirit, like a, you're talking to somebody and it's in your own head. There's this voice. There's this you know, kind of seeming dialogue. Whatever. Don't worry about it. The devil refers to a human experience. It's not the devil that is um, isolated from God and an actual threat to God. The devil is an agent of God. An angel of God is how it's, you know, the Hebrews would say. Um, everything is an instrument of God. Everything is an aspect of God. 
So reality cannot be broken. There's no isolated parts. There's nothing except reality, so there's nothing to break it. There's only reality. There's nothing to break reality. There's only God. There's nothing to break God or defeat God. That's that's a misunderstanding of the of the term. God cannot be divided. There's nothing except God. So there's nothing to divide God. Even language or logos is an aspect of reality, of God, of the branching, of the living process of the eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent one. Many words, but only one reality. 